Well, well in the wake of the recent mass shootings, people have had a lot of questions. Yes, one question being raised is what constitutes someone being mentally fit to stand trial? And what does it take to deem the shooter criminally insane? Vic Bajaj is here now to talk more about that with us this morning. Good morning, Vic. Good, Good morning. See nice to see you as well. Thank you. It, you know, this is a, a really interesting time and a difficult time in the courts as, as we see uh, these numbers of mass shootings increase and how to prosecute them. Uh, oftentimes, the, the defense is looking to deem a shooter in these types of situations as mentally unfit, insane to lessen the sentence. What is the burden of proof there? What do you what do you do in these cases? Well, you have to have initially a showing, what we'd call a proffer, an offer of proof to the court to even allow the defense to bring forward this type of an argument or a defense. Basically, you have to show that an individual does not know the consequences of their actions. And as far as the competency issue while you're in court, the individual cannot know what, what's going on, what the proceedings are, who their lawyer is, and what the process is in criminal court. So legal insanity really does its best to put legal and lawyer-like words on common sense, which is you, you didn't know the difference between right and wrong when the crime was committed. Once you step foot into a court, the analysis is whether you understand what the role of your lawyer is, the court is, the jury is, and of course what the penalties may be in the case. So a little bit of a different definition when you talk about insanity as a defense for the act versus being criminally incompetent or incompetent to stand trial, but really the same sort of a foundation with a different definition and a set of words. Uh, when we look at this, these types of definitions in the context of what we have seen, unfortunately, and one can only imagine the horror that people are going through, actually living through what's happened more than us reporting on it, I, I couldn't imagine. So our hearts and, and souls and feelings go out to everyone who's been a victim here, obviously. But when you talk about uh, those who have premeditated and have, in, in essence, given manifestos, I am going to do X, Y, and Z because of my hatred for a population A, B, and C. Or I'm just not happy. Someone turned me down for a date, and I'm excluded uh, from all my classmates in middle or high school or college, so I'm going to hurt innocent people. What we're starting to see now is, I believe, a diminished value for criminal insanity as a defense. And that really is, in my opinion, due to the proliferation of social media and the immediate access to voice an individual's thoughts or sometimes negative concerns. If we turn back the clock, about 15 years ago, we did not have this type of evidence or information. <clears throat> so while we may believe that the impetus or the motive for a crime may be racial or ethnically based or demographically based or um, socioeconomically based, there was very little proof to back that assertion. And now, through the proliferation of social media, Google, Facebook, YouTube, even the dark web that is accessible to law enforcement officers for the most part, we have the ability to gain evidence to explain why this conduct is occurring. This phenomenon, in my opinion, makes it very difficult for defense attorneys throughout the union to effectively argue criminal insanity when we're looking at crimes such as these. So let me ask you something. If Let's say somebody has a family member and they're recognizing changes in their behavior. Yes. That family member possesses firearms and now they're, they're going, hey, he's not square. Something's not connecting right up there. What options would that family have? Well, any family member must take every action, whether there's a municipal law or a city law or state or federal, to protect the weapons, number one. Uh, as responsible gun owners, those of us who own weapons for our own protection and protection of our family members, we hold that in very high regard. It would be very hard for anyone to find a firearm in a safe Second Amendment uh, uh, proponent's home without that person telling you where it is or, or how to get access to it. So rule number one is the firearms have to be safely secured within the possession of an individual who has constructive control over that firearm. Now the other answer to your very astute question is, what are the duties for an individual who may see red flags with those who they know or love? Um, there was an enormous debate, I would say, about 20 years ago in the union here when we talked about misprision of a felony. And this is a, a felony crime which essentially says if you know of a felony, 
or you should know of a felony that's about to be committed, you have a proactive duty to report that. Now, many courts throughout the United States have struck down this type of legislation, uh, really because there is a lack of probable cause to report that crime. So the same way we may in today's world, as a good analogy, see domestic violence restraining orders based upon firearms. If individuals feel that those who may have a firearm may be a risk, well, our city has allowed individuals to go on down to the courthouse and say, well, I think this individual who has a gun may be a risk. Let's get a restraining order against him. Now, that's, a very, that's an extreme move because what it really does is allow citizens to convert into citizen complainants, but more importantly, other than citizen complainants who we believe and law enforcement is allowed to rely upon, and for instance, in regards to arrest warrants or search warrants, there's a very high probability of vindictive reporting in these types of allowances in the statutes. And we don't want our citizens to turn into members of a police state. There is a very strong uh, debate and a collision between an individual's First Amendment rights and those that can be translated into potential future criminal behavior. And that's something we're going to wrestle with, I think, for the next 10 or 20 years in this country. It's a double-edged sword, certainly. Um, Absolutely. Just, uh, really different times and obviously going to have to approach it differently. Vic, Vic Bajaj, we obviously uh, appreciate your expertise Thank in this you. manner as always. Um, so thanks for being with us it's this my morning. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so Great much. To see you. Thank you.